Hello and welcome to Talks on Law. I'm Joel Cohen. Today we'll be discussing a particularly serious cause of action related to some particularly tragic circumstances, brain injuries to a newborn child. Joining us remotely to provide some practitioner insights is Patrick Salvi Jr. from Chicago, Illinois. Patrick, welcome to Talks on Law. Thank you for having me. Patrick, what we're talking about today is a set of circumstances that brings with it an incredible human emotional toll. Uh, maybe you can walk us through an example of, of a case like this. Sure. The way that this usually starts is uh, parents will come to our firm and they'll have a profoundly injured child. Uh, sometimes they'll know relatively early on that something seemed to uh, be amiss uh, and seemed to go wrong during childbirth. And other times uh, they come to us uh, maybe even years later, hoping that their child would not have a serious brain injury. But then as their child misses milestones, they realize that the diagnosis typically of cerebral palsy uh, is a very, very serious one and lifelong one. Patrick, we, we don't have you for too much time, so maybe we should jump into the cause of action. The brain injury of a child is always tragic, but it's not always a legal cause of action. What do attorneys need to demonstrate to be able to recover uh, in a civil suit? There are two really very important aspects of our investigation that we need to uh, look at carefully immediately once we get all the medical records. Number one, was there negligence? Uh, was something done wrong? And very typically what you look at in these circumstances is whether or not uh, there was a delay in the delivery. And so frequently what we will see when a child is brain injured is there might be, for example, fetal monitor strips. That's the little strip that comes out of the machine. Uh, anybody who's uh, uh, been through the birthing process, whether as a mom or a dad or otherwise, knows that the laboring mother is hooked up to a fetal monitor strip. And that fetal monitor strip, that, that band that goes over the, the belly, uh, or sometimes it's an internal electrode, what it does is it monitors the baby's heart rate. And the baby's heart rate, in a lot of ways, is a direct connection to how the brain is functioning. And so when there's a decrease in the oxygenation, there is a decrease in the heart rate. Uh, or uh, the heart rate uh, on the fetal monitor strip shows patterns that are uh, not normal, that are indicative of a potential uh, pending brain injury. And when those, uh, those warning signs show up on the fetal monitor strip, the health providers need to act, whether it's the nurses or the doctor, they need to act. And so first we got to look at, did they act appropriately? And if the answer is yes, and nonetheless there was a brain injury, uh, then we can't do anything about it. But if the answer is no, the healthcare providers did not do what they should have done, uh, then we move forward to ensure that we can prove causation. So step one is demonstrating that something went wrong uh, or that procedures weren't properly followed. And step two is showing that that's what caused the injury? That's right. And so uh, if we can show that there was negligence, uh, then the question is, was in an acute hypoxic event? What does that mean? Well, that means, do we have evidence to show that the brain injury occurred in and around the time of birth when the healthcare providers weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing? And if the answer is yes, then we have a case and we move forward. This seems like it's probably one of the more challenging aspects of your job, um, because as humans, there's so much inputs, there's so many ways that our bodies are interacting with our environments, so much that could go wrong. Yeah, that's right. And that's why frequently these cases require numerous experts. So typically in a case like this, we'll have an obstetrician or a maternal fetal medicine specialist. So in other words, a doctor that can help us understand whether or not the uh, obstetrician in the case uh, that was in charge of taking care of mom and baby uh, whether or not he or she uh, did everything he or she was supposed to do. We'll also have an obstetrical nurse to do the same thing for the nursing staff. But in addition to that, to prove the causation end of things, uh, we have to uh, be able to prove causation. And frequently that requires various experts like a pediatric neurologist, 
uh, a pediatric neuroradiologist to look at the MRIs, uh, a placental pathologist to help us understand the placental pathology, because sometimes there are indications within the placenta that help us understand why the baby is injured. These are complex cases, and that's why uh, the lawyers that handle them need to understand the medicine from soup to nuts, from, from the obstetrical care all the way through proving causation and looking at the evidence to prove that it's an acute injury, and then all the way through the damages to show uh, what the child is going to need over the course of his or her life in terms of uh, care. From your experience, what would make, for example, a particularly strong case where you know a parent would have a, a particularly clear cause of action? So uh, when I mentioned the acute uh, hypoxic ischemic injury, the word acute is just, uh, people generally know what it is, but in this context, it's like within the few hours leading up to birth. So how do you prove that? Well, typically when a child has an acute injury, there are immediate findings. Uh, so if someone comes to us with a case and they say, uh, well, no, there was really nothing that traumatic or dramatic during the course of the delivery, but later on, it seemed like my child wasn't meeting milestones. Odds are that's not going to be a case. But if a mother and a father, uh, they have a child that, for example, after birth, uh, the neonatologists, who are the doctors that take care of young babies, they suggested, for example, brain cooling. That's a very popular treatment modality now for acute brain injuries where they literally cool a baby who they suspect has had a recent brain injury during the delivery prod, labor and delivery. And the cooling is meant to reduce the brain swelling. So if that happened, for example, uh, then odds are that any injury that is residual uh, occurred during the labor and delivery. That's just one example of a finding that uh, would point us towards an acute injury. You used a couple of other technical terms that for the non-doctors and non-medically trained amongst us, uh, it may be a little, uh, a little foreign. What was hypoxic or ischemic? What are those words? So hypoxia is a fancy word for lack of oxygen. And so when someone is hypoxic, it just means that there's not as much oxygen getting to the tissues as is necessary. Ischemia is a lack of blood flow. And so if there is ischemia, that means there's just diminished blood flow to the brain. And so those two things kind of work in tandem. And there's a fancy term called hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. What that basically means is low oxygen, low blood flow, leading to encephalopathy, which is a disorder of the brain. And so when there's acute hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, that means there is a recent hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Uh, and so that's a, that's a term of art, certainly in obstetrics. As I mentioned, our hearts are, are certainly with, you know, the parents who are, who are dealing with an injured child, but could you give an example of a case where, you know, a parent comes to you and you're, you have to tell them that you're unable to help where the case just isn't there? Maybe the hardest part of my job, because anybody that comes to our office has gone through a life-changing event, and this is probably amongst uh, the top. So there was a, a mother that came to our office uh, that had a number of diagnosed infections in the weeks leading up to the birth of her child, and uh, she didn't feel as though a lot had been done for her, despite the fact that she was diagnosed with, uh, with these infections time and again, uh, about a handful of times in the months leading up to the delivery. And so we looked at all the records, the fetal monitor strips, the, the uh, neonatal records, uh, meaning the records after the baby was born. We looked at it all and we just couldn't find where there was a negligent cause of the injury. It seemed as though the injury was probably something that was long lasting. Despite that, I had to go to uh, the parents and say, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. And these are parents that have a severely disabled child, a, a, a child who for her whole life will be disabled. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just very unfortunate uh, that, uh, that I couldn't help them. Uh, but it's also very important, and it's uh, simply us as the gatekeepers of the civil justice system that we make sure we only bring meritorious cases to the courthouse. There's no evil villain necessarily on the other side of the V. These are, these are doctors and healthcare workers who, although they may make mistakes, are, are generally uh, doing the best they can. 
Yeah, that's right. And really, there's no demonization here whatsoever. It's the civil justice system. And as I ask jurors in voir dire, uh, I, I always ask them, I say, if somebody made a mistake, who should pay for it? The victim or the wrongdoer? And it's a bit rhetorical, but it's important for people to understand that context in medical malpractice because uh, by and large, uh, people trust and, and frequently have a great affinity for their physicians. Uh, and they should, uh, because statistics have borne out that uh, the malpractice cases, 50% of them are brought against 5% of the physicians. Uh, so most healthcare providers are just outstanding and, uh, and obviously needed. You're joining us today from Chicago. Are there specific aspects of Illinois law that impact this type of case? Yes. So Illinois, I would say, is a favorable venue for injured victims. Uh, there are no caps on damages as it relates to medical malpractice actions. To give an example, our neighbors to the east in Indiana, they have a cap on total damages, economic and non-economic, of $1.25 million. Economic are those damages that are like lost wages, medical expenses. Non-economic are things like loss of a normal life, pain and suffering, things of that nature. Uh, other uh, states, they have caps on non-economic damages, but don't cap economic damages. Um, either way, uh, Illinois, as a state that has no caps, allows for an injured victim to bring their case uh, and there are no caps on uh, what, for example, their future care needs might be. Um, between uh, 24-hour care on a daily basis, extensive medications, extensive medical equipment, wheelchairs, trachs, G-tubes, 24-hour nursing care, the lifelong expenses. So you're talking 50, 60, 70 plus years of, of care uh, add up into the tens of millions of dollars. Uh, now, let's put that aside because what people need to remember is that when someone recovers damages for economic expenses, like future medical care, that's just money that they're going to hold until the time that they need to pay someone else. It does nothing to compensate these children for what they've really lost, which is the ability to go to school and play sports, the ability to learn how to read and read a good book to watch and enjoy a movie, to have normal relationships, to get married and have children of their own. That's the human loss where the non-economic damages come in. And it probably means that a lot of the cases simply don't go forward. That's absolutely right. Let's talk about damages. One of the reasons why malpractice insurance for labor and delivery doctors is so high is because a damage to a baby lasts an entire lifetime. How are damages actually calculated? And maybe you could share a little bit about you know, your calculus when you're putting a number next to one of these injuries. Sure. There's usually two main battlegrounds when it comes to damages in these cases. Uh, number one is, uh, what is the lifelong care? Will this child need 24-hour care? Uh, and then what is the cost of that? Uh, and so in extrapolating... 60, 70 plus years, the plaintiffs are typically putting forward experts that are saying, hey, look, with good care, this child is going to live a full life expectancy or close to it. Whereas on the defense side, frequently what they'll have is an expert that says, no, this is a child that has tremendous risk in terms of his or her life expectancy. And the likelihood is that this child is going to die uh, within the next 15 to 20 years. That's so shocking that, the, you know, a defense strategy can be, we don't actually owe you that much because the child won't live long enough to incur some of those expenses. That's right. And so as the plaintiff's lawyer, uh, it's my job to make sure that the jury understands fully what the defense is talking about. What they're talking about is a shortened life expectancy which actually is another element of damages in Illinois. If, if the defendant has done something wrong and it's shortened someone's life expectancy, uh, they don't get away with that scot-free. And so that's a whole separate element of damages. But I think the defense frequently will see uh, that element of damages, shortened life expectancy, as less than what the total cost of keeping the child alive for more decades would be. And so another thing uh, that we 
ensure that the jury hears is if this child is to die prematurely, how is it how is it going to happen? Because it's not going to be pleasant. It's going to be painful. It's going to be something like a pneumonia or other type of infectious process that isn't caught, something of that nature. And so the jury needs to understand what the defense is saying. When you're listing the damages, are you generally stacking up the costs and pain and suffering? Is there also lost earnings or lost potential that a a person could make over a lifetime? Sure. So uh, for example, in these types of cases, typically the injured plaintiff is not employable, never will be employable. It's a disabled person who will never be able to make a living. And so you take their demographics, their parents' education, and various factors that can go into a calculation on what their uh, lifetime earnings would have been, and that's compensable. So that's something that the jury can consider. Uh, I've already mentioned the future medical expenses, and that is frequently in these cases a significant number, as well as the past medical expenses. By the time you get to trial, there's usually been three, four, five years, or even more of past medical expenses that can be significant. And then there's the non-economic damages, uh, which, as I said earlier, is the human loss. Uh, And as the human loss, I think it's the most significant loss, the things that are most precious to us in our lives. uh, uh, Being able to say, I love you to your mother or your father. uh, If that isn't worth millions of dollars, then, then what is? Patrick Selvey Jr. is an attorney based in Chicago. Patrick, thanks for your time. Thank you, Joel.